Praise God. Thank you, musicians. We appreciate your ministry tonight. We do have a victory report here. We forgot to mention Zach Mateo wants to give God for a promotion on the job. Promotion right during a plague. Only God could do that. Thank God for his blessing tonight. If you have your Bible tonight, the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 10. I want to minister tonight from one verse of scripture, verse number 29, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. William Booth, who is the founder of the Salvation Army, he said, I consider that the chief dangers which confront the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. Now, this is William Booth speaking a very powerful prophetic word about the future. And it's very interesting that everything that he was fearful about, prophesying about, has come to pass in our generation. We have, uh, in our generation, thought that we could have Christianity without Christ. We've uh, discovered a new gospel that's being preached, a modern gospel, salvation without uh, regeneration, heaven without hell. But I want you to notice here his words, a religion without the Holy Ghost. A religion without the Holy Ghost. Now that's speaking about our generation. And so I want to minister tonight a message that I've titled, Modern Crimes Against the Holy Spirit. From the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse number 29, if you have your Bible tonight, one, one verse of Scripture, Hebrews 10, verse number 29, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. Insulted the spirit of grace. Modern crimes against the Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you tonight for your anointing once again. We have no confidence in the flesh, and I'm coming into agreement with those that are watching tonight live stream. I'm coming into agreement with this skeleton crew here tonight. I'm asking God for divine favor and divine intervention. We desperately need you in this hour. Without you, we can do nothing. And tonight, I'm asking for a double portion. I'm asking for that anointing that destroys the yoke. You didn't just come to break the yoke. You came to destroy the yoke. And I'm asking God that you would break the yoke and destroy the yoke tonight by that anointing. You're going to destroy the yoke of sin and bondage, bondage tonight. You're going to heal the sick and afflicted, and you're going to fill with the Holy Ghost. And I give you the praise and the glory right now and give you a free hand to move tonight in Jesus' wonderful name. And all of God's people shouted, Amen and Amen. Hebrews 10, 29 was our text. And he's dealing here with primarily the sin of apostasy which involves three things. If you don't know what apostasy means, it simply means an act of refusing to continue to follow or obey or obey or recognize a religious faith. Another definition of apostasy is abandonment of previous loyalties. Probably the most simple word in the English dictionary is the word defection. You're talking here about the sin of apostasy, and we find that the sin of apostasy involves three things. Paul mentions them here in the book of Hebrews, trampling the Son of God underfoot, number one. Number two, counting the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as a common thing. And notice number three, which I want to focus on tonight, and insulted the spirit of grace 
And this is my focus. Hebrews 10, 29, again, King James Version is very interesting. And hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. The living Bible reads to insult the Spirit of grace. N-I-R-V means disrespected. One translation reads, laughs at the Spirit. Another dishonor and another outraged. It means that the Spirit of God can be outraged. Now we're all familiar tonight with the six sins committed against the Holy Spirit. And I'm trusting that you have your Bibles open tonight, that you're following along with us in the Bible. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, lying or tempting the Holy Spirit, despising the Holy Spirit, resisting or striving with the Holy Spirit, vexing or grieving the Holy Spirit, and quenching the Spirit. We're very familiar with these six sins committed against the Holy Spirit. But I, I want to look tonight at what I call three modern sins against or crimes against the Holy Spirit. These are modern crimes against the Holy Spirit tonight from this text. And I want to consider with you, first of all, tonight, the first crime is false submission to government. I want you to hold on tonight because I'm going to violate everything that you've ever thought about friendship and relationships. Someone said the old adage, if you want to keep your friends, never discuss religion or politics. And tonight I'm going to talk about both of them. So I'm not being politically correct tonight or Pentecostal correct. Because tonight I'm going to deal with both of these. D.O. Moody's words are coming to pass. He saw a danger coming that they would attempt to exercise religious freedom without the Holy Spirit. And he saw a danger coming, religion without the Holy Spirit, and politics without God. I want you to think about that. Now, we need to have a biblical worldview. In other words, we need to think biblically in these last days. We need to take a fresh look tonight at one of the most abused and misunderstood scripture in the entire Word of God. So hold on to your horses tonight. Put your helmet and cleats on because I'm going to kick over one of your golden calves tonight from Romans chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Now, this is probably one of the most misunderstood and abused scriptures in the Word of God. First of all, we have to realize that we are subject, first of all, to the sovereignty of God, not man. Are you hearing me? Revelations 21 and verse number 6, he said to me, it is done. And Jesus makes a declaration here, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. So this, this passage is very clear tonight that God is the one who rules in the heavens above and the earth beneath. He is still King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's still on the throne tonight. Even in the middle of this virus, God is on the throne. Jesus is still Lord. Paul was using here a phrase. Look at our t text, Romans 13 again, if you're taking notes. He uses here a phrase in the King James. It reads, the authorities that exist. Now, this is a reference to authority that has been endorsed by God. Satan is a rogue authority. Can you say amen? He is a rebel from the very beginning. 
Mario Morello wrote in his recent book, here are two boneheaded ideas in the church today. Number one, all government is from God and we must submit and not mention politics. That's one boneheaded idea. Number two, a candidate must be sinless before we can vote for them. Romans chapter 13 verse number 1 does not mean that all worldly authorities have been established by God. Paul was instructing the saints to honor the godly institution of government that God himself created. How many know tonight that God is the one who created government? Exodus chapter 18 and verse 21, God gives Moses the concept of government and how he wanted it organized. Listen to what the Bible says. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Notice, notice again as you read it, this is not a dictatorship. It is a representative theocracy built on God's law similar to America's representative government built on the rule of law. The modern day fallacy that we are to stay out of politics and submit to government no matter what. God is always balanced. How many, God, how many know the God that we serve is balanced? A false balance is an abomination to the Lord. So I want you to hear what I'm saying. I don't want you to read in something else that I'm not saying. God is the one who established government. But the balance to the threat of tyranny with authorities that he raises up. Romans chapter 13, verse number 4. Read it again. God's minister is raised up to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So it's very important tonight that we understand he tells us that no ruling authority from God is a terror to good works. Any promise in the Word of God, any truth in the Word of God, we find that there are also conditions to that truth. In other words, they do not persecute God's people or enact laws to ban the gospel. Now tonight, no sane person, there's not a sane person in the world that would believe that Hitler was God's will for Germany. God brought retribution down, divine retribution, let me add this to it, upon the Nazis through the nations of the world. As a matter of fact, the two people he despised the most were blacks and Jews, and I'm here to tell you tonight that black soldiers and Jewish soldiers helped kick Adolf Hitler. Hitler's no longer with us. And I'm glad to be the one to tell you tonight that Mussolini is dead. Hitler is dead. Amen. Saddam Hussein is dead. Tonight, Bin Laden is dead. All of those who rose up and over the years, in the decades and the years that have passed, they've all risen up and had their time of glory, but they're no longer, longer with us tonight. But the kingdom of God still rules on. God is still the ruler. God is still in control. He's still king of kings and lord of lords. Refusing to obey man's anti-God law is not a violation of Romans chapter 13. It's a confirmation of it. You cannot obey an evil law without disobeying a divine law. Acts chapter 4 verses 18 to 20. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and we have heard. Peter violated, yes, violated a direct order from a rogue civil government. German believers in the 1940s, late 30s, 
abuse the same verses that I read tonight from Romans 13, verses 1 to 5. They abused these same verses to justify their apathy. Dietrich Bonhoeffer could not open the eyes of the German church to the impending horrors of Hitler. I believe he was a Lutheran pastor. And in his preaching, he blamed it upon the fad of cheap grace, number one, and their blind submission to ungodly authority. I want you to listen to Bonhoeffer's words and let them sink in tonight. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. So many of these dumb ideas are not scriptural, and I believe that it insults the Spirit of God that's in us. This happens to be one of the modern crimes against the Holy Spirit, a high crime. God wants governing authorities, thank God for laws, to enforce civil order, not lawlessness, anarchy, and wickedness. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, listen to these words, and Paul gives us some insight into the nature of God, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the congregation of the Lord's people. God doesn't set up evil governments. Nations do and can pick evil leaders. Hosea chapter 8 and verse number 4 is very clear. Speaking about people, they set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. So tonight, let me just add my ingredient here. Don't complain if you don't vote. We have no business complaining if we don't vote at the polls. And I'm praying everyone will vote at the polls this coming November. I have the same attitude that President Reagan had when he addressed the Russians in his day, trust but verify. Yes, I trust but you need to verify, you know? Christians are good citizens. Hallelujah, we are very good citizens, but don't violate our constitutional rights. The reality is, is all of the models have been wrong so far. As the church, we have complied to every protocol tonight every government health protocol we have complied with those protocols but it's time to open up the churches and it's time to open up the economy we're not insane tonight I know we may look half crazy sometimes but we're not insane we all understand the necessity the necessary measures must be taken to contain a pandemic we know that but we're a public and not a nanny state. Remember? Remember when this all started? They tried to convince us this is only going to be a two-week vacation. It's like an, an extended spring break. Five weeks later, going on six weeks, spring break needs to be over, and we need to put our people back to work, and we need to come back to church. And I hope you play this in the governor's office. Number two, second modern day crime against the Holy Spirit is the crime of the contaminated crowd. This is what I call crowd pleasing. I was reading, maybe you read the story about Harry Houdini. And most of you older folks would know who Harry Houdini is. He's one of the most famous escape artists in history. There was only one trap that Harry Houdini couldn't escape, and that was his audience. I want you to listen to this story. His demise began on October the 11th, 1926, while being shackled into his Chinese water torture cell during a performance in Albany, New York. Harry Houdini was struck by a piece of faulty equipment and broke his left ankle. His doctor told him to cancel his tour but instead, the magician carried on to Montreal. While there, he gave a lecture at McGill University. On October the 22nd, he invited some McGill students to visit him in his dressing room at the Princess Theater. A student named J. Warden Whitehead 
Ask Houdini if it was true that he could take a hard punch to the stomach. Houdini said the rumors were true. So without warning, Whitehead delivered a forceful, well-aimed punch to his stomach. Houdini was not ready for the punch as he plopped down on a couch due to his ankle pain. This is where the story gets very, very tricky. Houdini dismissed the pain from those punches and did the show that night anyway. His pain only got worse when he took a train to Detroit for his next engagement. Soon he had severe pain, cold sweats, fatigue, and a fever of 104 degrees, and a doctor suspended, or rather suspected, appendicitis and told him to go to a hospital. Instead, the conjurer went on with the show and collapsed right after the final curtain. It would be his last show. That night, doctors removed his appendix. They found that it had burst already days before, and Houdini's death was listed as being caused by a ruptured appendix. At that time, they thought the blows to his abdomen burst his appendix, but today we know that that is extremely unlikely, but those punches did mask the real threat, a threat that if it would have been known in time, it could have saved his life. Houdini's audience wanted more, and the pressure to present a more dazzling escape ultimately took his life. Even when he didn't want to perform, even when he wasn't on stage, the audience never, never let him off the hook. And he couldn't resist the need to please him. So what actually killed Houdini was his obsession to please the crowd. The church in America has been affected by what I call the Houdini syndrome. The Holy Spirit is no doubt outraged by the wanton appetites of the crowd. We're warned in Scripture about people pleasing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5 Listen to the Apostle Paul. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Listen to the admonition. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, but watch thou in all things, endure all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of your ministry. Notice, there are, these are the last words of a father to his son in the Lord. He's writing here. This is Paul writing to his disciple Timothy. These are important words. If, if you think these verses tonight are warning against false teachers, you need to look again very closely at the text that I just read, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Notice the following pronouns in order. Let me give them to you in order. They, their, they, themselves, they, and their. The false teacher... In 2 Timothy chapter 4 is mentioned only once. The audience is mentioned seven times. This is one of the high crimes today against the Holy Spirit is the contaminated crowd and people pleasing. This isn't a warning to the people about preachers. This is a warning to a preacher about the audience. And I want to say something tonight. For every fraudulent preacher, there is a consumer. Can we draw an illusion tonight from the drug culture? The war on drugs in the United States just isn't a problem with suppliers and the cartel. The users buying the drugs keep them in business. So the issue tonight is more than the cartels and the supplier. The issue is a permissive society. And it's the same with false prophets. Listen to this quote. When you glorify pleasure and remove the shame, you enable the addiction. 
So we need to talk tonight about the pulpit subject matter. Today the focus, listen to me, is largely derived from what the crowd wants to hear. 2 Timothy chapter 4, they will not endure sound doctrine. In other words, they're looking for a shortcut. One preacher called it ear candy. What they're looking for is something sweet to the hearing. Matthew 24, verse number 4, and Jesus answers in them and said, take heed that no one deceives you. So this is a mark of the last days. This word deceived is the Greek word planeo, to go astray, deceive, err, seduce, wander, or be out of the way. It's interesting that this word planeo is where we get the word planet. Planets are in an orbit. But a subtle deviation in the orbit of a planet would cause the world to go into a catastrophe. We saw this happen many years ago when we had a 9.0 earthquake strike in the Pacific Rim. And they say to this day that at that time, it, hit, it was so hard, it hit so hard uh, that it affected the orbit of the earth. Can you imagine this is what God is saying here. The moment you're deceived, the moment you begin to go for the fried ice cream and begin to swallow everything that comes along, it's a very strong warning from the Apostle Paul that you're going to go astray and be deceived and err and seduced. And it's interesting here that he's not speaking so much to preachers as he's speaking here to those that hear the preaching. Seek the approval of God and not the audience is the message. Second. Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I submit to you this evening that the contaminated crowd, if they have their way, the speaker will leave his original message and deviate and move beyond what God told them to preach. Now, sad to say tonight that pulpits are filled with men who used to preach with anointing and they preach the word of God, but today they're tinkering with people's minds. Listen to me. The Bible and psychology will never mix. East is east and west is west and the twain will never meet. God has not called us to preach psychology. He's called us to preach the word of God. Billy Graham even up to the end of his ministry, he spent as much time discerning what not to say as much as what to say. Listen to me. He found out, like all gospel preachers have found out, that if you obey God, the crowds will come anyway. He proved that out. Thousands of people came because people have an appetite for truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you mad. I mean, set you free. This is the generation that cannot endure sound doctrine. It's an hour and a half worship service, 15-minute sermonette to Christianette so they can hurry and get outside and smoke their cigarette. That's the generation we live in. I want to look thirdly to third crime, and this is what I really wanted to preach. I said all that to say this to get to what I really wanted to preach. And the third modern-day crime against the Holy Spirit is the crime of withholding the baptism in the Holy Ghost. You know, the question that we should ask today, whatever happened to the baptism in the Holy Spirit? I got saved in the Jesus movement, and... Um, I know some folks, they don't, want to hear, they don't want to hear that again from me about history, but I'm, I'm thinking about the history of our fellowship, history of my salvation, my experience with God. In, back in the day, when people would get saved, there were always people down at the altar praying for them to be filled with the Holy Ghost. They didn't have to have the guru. They didn't have to have the pastor in on every session. They didn't pray for them to have the pastor come down and pray every time, but almost in every service in the altar space, you would see people standing around, people getting filled with the Holy Ghost, converts getting saved, and then they wanted to get them, they got them filled with the Holy Ghost immediately. It's like Acts chapter 19, they're still standing in the water of baptism when Paul lays his hands on them 
and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Go back and read it for yourself in the book of uh, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. Those disciples at Ephesus, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we haven't even heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he baptizes them in the name of Jesus. Talks about water baptism. He, pre he preaches to them about the baptism of John. And then he lays hands on them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible said in verse number 7 that they begin to speak with tongues and prophesy. They're still standing in the water. Today you have to wait for the biannual camp meeting to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Wait for the next revival or the next evangelist to come through. I want to tell you that the centerpiece of Pentecostal churches, the centerpiece of our fellowship has been evangelism, we know. But at the center of evangelism, we get people filled with the Holy Ghost in a public setting. We don't have an overflow service. We don't have an afterglow service because we're afraid somebody's mascara might run or we might mess up their hairdo. No, we pray for people publicly in the service to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not the centerpiece now of the Pentecostal movement. They are Pentecostal in name only. And I would venture to say that one of the largest Pentecostal denominations in America, probably over half of them now, do, do not speak in tongues. They do not worship God in a public setting. So to exclude the baptism of the Holy Ghost from the life of the church is a decision that was conceived in hell. And I want to say tonight that this is a high crime against the Holy Spirit to withhold the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 2 Timothy 3, verse number 5, we have a warning from Paul, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. In other words, you have a whole generation who are living out their faith by their own power. Christian apologist, Ravi Zacharias, some of you know who he is, and I quote, listen to this quote, he said, I had dinner with a preacher with a spirit-filled background who claims he speaks to more via television than anyone else in the world. I don't know who this person, he never mentions the person's name. And he told me that there is not much difference between Islam and Christianity. What's wrong with this picture? The command of Jesus is wait till you be endued with power from on high. The church was forbidden to begin operation until they had received it. Acts chapter 1 and verse number wait. Wait until you be endued with power from on high. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall become my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So the absence of the baptism is why we have Two extremes in the church. We have those who believe nothing, and we have those who believe everything. That's the reason why we have the two extremes. Both are products of a lack of discernment and power. He is called the spirit of truth. What happens to truth without him? We need the spirit of truth. There is the spirit of truth, there's the spirit of error, and you know the difference by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to close this sermon tonight. This is a very short message tonight, but I want to conclude the most devastating result of banning the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that it removes soul winning. We are in the soul winning business. That's the reason why we must come back together and do church. Amen. Live stream is fine. But we find in the book of Romans, very carefully written to you and I, Romans, he says, how shall they hear without a preacher? He's talking here about the connection between the Romans and the Apostle Paul. He's, in other words, he's saying, your salvation is connected to my personal pre presence. We don't send out satellites, my friend. We send out people to preach. We're already street preaching already on Guam, legally or illegal. It'll make no difference to me. Well, we're going to arrest you. We'll bring lots of handcuffs because our commission comes from the 
captain of our salvation, and his law is much higher than the law even of the United States. God's law. Long as those laws are righteous, they are a terror to evil. But how many know that law was created not to be a terror to those that are doing good? Quarantine is for people that are sick. Quarantining healthy people is control. And I've come to tell you tonight, amen, that uh, enough is enough and we need to get back to church and we need to get people filled with the Holy Ghost and send out firebrands tonight with the gospel of Christ. Soul winning is always the first thing that the devil removes from church life. The Holy Ghost makes our witness vibrant, compelling, and contagious. I'm getting ready to start a contagion of my own. Call it COVID-22. I don't care what you call it, but I'm getting ready to start a contagion of my own. And that's not going to be a disease. It's called the contagion of evangelism. It's Jesus. Jesus is the answer tonight. The Holy Ghost makes our witness vibrant. The preacher who consciously withholds the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a traitor. They are aiding and abetting the enemy. I want you to think about our humble beginnings, our history, our humble beginnings back at Azusa Street. It actually began back on the day of Pentecost. But in America, most Pentecostals feel that their roots are at Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California, 1906. And now today, from that humble beginning, we have 700 700 million Pentecostals around the world. 700 million. And the only one thing explains that. There's only one way to explain it. The rapid growth, the expansion of the kingdom of God is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. These are modern high crimes against the Holy Spirit. And I want to challenge you as I close tonight that it's time to repent and believe for a lasting outpouring in these last days, an outpouring of the Holy Ghost that will change the moral climate of our cities. Am I recommending tonight an armed revolution? Of course not. I've been in a few countries that had no law. After being in those countries and traveling back into the United States where there is peace, for the most part there is peace, and the reason why we have peace over the years is because of our Christian Judeo foundation which gives us the liberty and in the Constitution. The Second Amendment, First Amendment rights is the a right to gather. Second Amendment right, of course, is the right to bear arms and both of those are very closely related. The reason why we have the right to bear arms is because of tyrants. You ever wonder why we were never attacked from our borders? I'll tell you why we were never attacked from Canada, Mexico, or East and West Coast. is because they knew that the American public was armed. Hallelujah. God bless America. But these are high crimes against the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 13 is not a blank statement. It's not talking about submitting to ungodly law. Amen. We believe in law and order. We believe in our government. We believe in the Constitution. But I'm here to tell you that in that Constitution, it guarantees our rights to worship God in spirit and in truth. And tonight, we're going to exercise our right and pray for people right now as we bow in the presence of God. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed in the presence of the Lord tonight. You say, Pastor, I need God. I don't understand half the things you said tonight. But I do know this one thing. My heart is not right with God. I'm filled with guilt and sin and habit. I can't seem to be free. I want to be free. The Bible said, in whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And that's the wonderful thing about Christianity is that Christianity provides freedom. It's freedom. Freedom in salvation Freedom from sin, freedom from bondage. Some of you get up every day, you're driven 
in life by sin, by demon powers. And I've come to tell you tonight that Jesus is the answer to your life. We're not offering you church membership. We're not talking about signing your name to some kind of a creed. We're talking about being right with God. Pastor, I feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God is dealing with you. God is speaking to you. And you say, I need God tonight. I don't under understand all that you said, but I do know this one thing. My heart is not right with God. We're not asking to join our church. This is not a church membership drive. We're talking about your salvation. Are you right with God? If you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? That's the most important question. I want you to pray this prayer with me, and I want you to mean it from your heart. If you want this new life, I'm offering you a new life tonight. The Bible says very clearly that God in no wise will cast you out. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want you to pray this prayer, dear Lord Jesus. Say it with me out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight as sinner. I'm lost and without hope, without God. Jesus, forgive my sin. Wash me in your precious blood. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. I believe that Jesus died on Calvary's cross, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for writing my name down in the Lamb's book of life. I give you the praise and give you the honor. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to pray for the sick. I take dominion over sickness and disease in these bodies. I come into agreement with them right now. I come against pain. And I come against this coronavirus by the blood of Jesus. You foul curse from hell. I take dominion over you. I command pain to leave these bodies from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Let resurrection power come to life. Loose them and let them go free right now. I pray this tonight. In the powerful name of Jesus, I give you the praise and give you glory. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. You're watching.